the um, the cathedral paper. I need to know. Was it pretty easy? Was it easy? Was it really just so hard that you didn't sleep all week, or was it somewhere in between? Okay. Does anybody want to refute that? Okay, but not on account of not on account of your paper. Okay. Yes. I did not sleep much either, but it was not on account of your paper either. <laughs> oh. Well, you know what? Sometimes, Jaden, you don't make the family travel plans. I realize this, so none of you do. It's okay. Your parents know, and it's fine. Um, the reason I ask is because we are going to do one more of these. If you love, and I think I might have another one scheduled in January after Christmas, but I can't remember. If you love these, I'm sorry, we're only doing one more, but it's a longer one. If you hate these, it's the last one we're going to do, and we're going to do something completely different next. And it's very much more creative writing oriented, the next thing we're going to do. So if you like to make stuff up and write fiction, just buckle up and ride for the next two weeks for me and you'll get something you love. But um, but we will be revisiting this sort of thing maybe next semester. Okay, just Nathan had something and then Jonathan. Um, this book is not told well. Every, Ragnarok at the end is oh. so not dramatic. Three pages. And it was all the book was ever leading I know. Up Here's, well, technically, Ragnarok hasn't happened yet. See, this is the thing. It hasn't happened. So, but it's just sort of depressing to, to write a book for kids and then just not have any ending, really. So they kind of had to make up. You have to read the ending as this is what will happen someday when all those gods crash and burn and the world is starting. Because we're, according to the Norsemen, we're still in the age of warriors being gathered to go to Valhalla to fight at Ragnarok. We're still in that. So maybe that's why it feels a little meh because, because it was just kind of tacked on at the end. And honestly, I'm kind of with you, Nathan. I would have just liked it to end. Oh, and just get ready. You know, I don't know, store canned goods up or whatever. Get ready, get your survival gear because Ragnarok is coming. That would have been nice, yeah, but that's not what he chose to do. Whenever Odin, whenever Odin died, it just said Odin died in battle with like Fenrir the wolf. Yeah, I know. That's the case. I know. Yeah, maybe when died. it, maybe when it really happens, then we can get a better blow by blow account. But if, and it's not going to happen. I don't want to sound like I'm, but you know what I mean. I'm pretending. But when it happens, we'd all be, we'd all be dead. So we wouldn't, we wouldn't know. This is a very depressing start to our class, isn't it? I mean, did the Norsemen have one thing? I don't know. Jonathan, what would you like to say? Um, in this next story, um, will this next story not have people who are here? Do you mean our next book that we're going to read? Yeah. Um, by not people who are not here, do you mean is it like fiction? No, like not people who are jerks. Not people who are jerks. Oh, no, there's jerks in the next book, too. Do you know what, Jonathan? The world is just, this is a terrible thing to say to young people. The world is kind of full of jerks all over the place. It's really hard to escape. The, 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 the thing is not to be one yourself, I think, is the best we can do. is just to be good to other people and not be one of them. But no, the next book we're going to read is King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. And not all, and uh, yeah, there, there are some real jerk knights. <laughs> but there are some grand ones, too. So we'll focus on those, maybe. Yes, Jaden. Are we ever going to read Robin Hood? No, I took Robin Hood out of the list because I wanted to do Lord of the Rings and because two years ago, everybody complained about Robin Hood because they say prithy and, you know, they, t they talk in an old-fashioned way. And my students said, I don't know what they're talking about. But I highly recommend, I highly recommend Robin Hood. All right, okay. Yeah, yes, so How, the Howard Pyle, The Merry Adventures of Robin Hood by Howard Pyle. If you know, like over Christmas, maybe I should just tell you guys, you know, because I know it's Christmas, but are there 
there's a lot of downtime over Christmas break, right? You're waiting for family to come. You're waiting for the food to get cooked. You're waiting for the cookies to come out of the oven, whatever. You could read some Robin Hood. Okay. Did you have something, Zach? Okay. Um, let's talk about our writing. Okay. Now, I want you to write down what I say, because if you don't, you will, you will not remember what I've said. I know it. And you can just pick, pick a convenient blank page. Page 22 is blank. Page 24 is blank. They're blank, so you can take notes on them on a day like this. We were just talking about this, Jaden. What? Everybody should have a pencil. No, I have a pen. Does anybody have a pen or pencil for Jaden? Okay, I will I will bring it. No, it's fine, Jaden. It will save time if Zach doesn't mind. Here you go. Okay. I need right. one too. Oh. Okay. Now Nathan needs one. Oh. Oh, can you use a pen? You will use a pen. How about that? We're not even giving you a choice. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Now, we have been writing papers. Before I hand these out, let me give you my intro. We've been writing papers from only one source, right? I give you a paper and it tells you about the Bayou Tapestry or it tells you about <clears throat> cathedrals and you, you take notes on what's important or interesting and you write it. But when we want to learn about a topic, uh, and, and um, I will tell you when to start writing back there, Asher. And, like you were, I see you're ready to write. I'll tell you. Now write this down. Okay, this is not the part you have to write down. <clears throat> when we are learning about anything, a topic, we usually want to go to more than one source, more than one book. Can you think why that might be? What's good about looking at two or three or four books instead of just one? Yeah, Nathan. Um, so that you can get different points of view. Okay. Different points of view. For example, <clears throat> what if I am doing research on the Civil War? This is one that has two very distinctive points of view. And I'm looking at books written right after the war. If I, if I only look at books written by people in the North, I get one view. If I, if I look at a history book written by someone in the South, they're going to tell the story a little differently, aren't they? And it, and it, it, it fleshes out my picture. Um, can, can anyone think of another, just probably less important, but just as valid reason to go to more than one book or more than one source? One source could be the actual one source could be the actual oh. one source could be the actual one source. Yes. What if I check 10 books out of the library on the moon? because I'm doing some research on the moon. Well, I'm really, Jaden, I'm really into the moon, okay? 10 books. And nine of them tell me about the rocks and dust and, 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 and the composition of the moon. And one book tells me that the moon is made of green cheese. I don't know why they always say green cheese, because the moon isn't really green. Why do they always say the moon is made of green cheese? We'll just go with cheese. I don't even know why they think it's made of cheese. It looks a little like Swiss cheese, doesn't it? Okay, so anyway, this is not important. The important thing is that if nine books by people whose authority I trust say the moon is one thing, and then this one guy says it's made of cheese, I'm probably going to just not use the guy who said it's made of cheese. You know, if, if nine books say that William was the conqueror in the Battle of Hastings, but one of them says Harold actually lived and escaped and came back and was king later. That's not true. So, so if I just pick one book, what if I pick the one book that's telling me an inaccurate story? But, but multiplicity of sources helps assure that I'm getting the right, the right picture, the right story. You got an idea? Sources and a lot of times the books would be on the same row, like the Civil War, if you narrowed down, like, okay, I only want to know about Robert E. Island, whatever. So you narrow it down to him, and then yes. it doesn't have all the information you want. It doesn't have everything. No book can tell you everything about a subject. 
I mean, probably not even like something Q-tips or cotton balls or something really minor. Probably can't tell you everything that could possibly set, be said or known about them. So I don't know, maybe Q-tips. Um, so what we're going to do this time is we're going to use two sources instead of one to flesh out our picture. And the topic, the main topic is castles. Who doesn't love castles? Castles are cool. Do you know, out in Orion where I live, this has nothing to do with today's class, but it's a little interesting. Um, there's a teeny, teeny, teeny town, even teenier than Orion, called Warner. And in Warner, there is an honest to goodness small castle. We call, it's about a mile and a half from my house. It's called Warner Castle. It's, it was built in the, in the 1800s by a guy who was, I don't know, he had lots of money in the train industry and he thought the trains were going to come through Orion and it was going to be the next big place in Illinois and he was going to be the, you know, the overlord of Orion. I don't know. And he built this castle and it's got towers and it's got a stone coach house and everything and, and it's for sale right now. Wow. I know, I know, but it's $700,000. I know. And, and, and the pictures online don't show you any pictures inside because I think it costs, it costs a whole lot to heat and it needs some work, but it's got many acres and it's just tucked in these woods. And so sometimes whenever people visit me, I say, would you like to drive past Warner Castle? And we go and we go look. So, so even we have sort of a, a miniature castle close to us, but we're going to write about much bigger castles than Warner Castle. Um, so here's what I want to do. Um, Juliana, take one of these. Actually, let me do it in half. Take one of these and pass it down. Actually, I think I'm going to give more to you because I think it'll go around that way. Hans, take one and pass it down. And when you get it, I want you to write on the top of the first page, source one. Write. I don't want to erase what I've got here. This is for later. Write source one on that paper at the top. I know there's two pages. You don't have to write it on both. They're stapled together because they're one unit. Source one. Now, I'm going to send around a second paper. At the top of this one, I want you to write source two. There you go. I here, we're just gonna give you the four. Oh, did I do it right? No. Okay, there's the four. And here, let's put another one in that pile. It doesn't really matter which one is one and two, but I just wanted you to know that the two stapled together is one source. And I am going to write on the board, and you, this is the part you're going to copy down, are going to copy down the steps you're going to do this week, okay? Step number one, pick two topics. Now, you have a couple of, of, of options here. First of all, you could read these papers and you could jot down, oh, this paper says a lot about this. This paper says a lot about that. Or you can gamble with some things that you're pretty sure any paper about castles is going to talk about. Can someone tell me a good castle topic? What was something they might talk about? How they're, how they're built. So these are just some ideas. You don't have to use these, but you can. One idea is how were they built? Just like cathedrals, we're talking about a time when they didn't have, um, you know, gas-powered machinery. And in fact, we're going to talk about, um, I'm going to talk a little more about cathedrals today. And you read, obviously, you guys know all about cathedrals now because you wrote about them. But um, what they, how, how they, what sort of machinery they used man-powered, body-powered machinery instead of gas-powered. What's another topic that we might, something about castles we might talk about? 
What did they do in them? I'm going to call that topic life in a castle. What was a life in a castle like? And this leads me to maybe another one. It's kind of related. Why were they built? That's another possibility. Am I writing too small for you guys in the back? Okay, good. Can you think of another one? What? What did you say? Um, structural integrity. Ooh, ooh, that's very deep. Um, we we might we might include that in how were they built? That might be part of that. I had something in my head just a minute ago. It will come back. Um, where were they placed? Okay, where? Yeah, where? That might go with why. Maybe they might be in a, in a, um, uh, oh, I can we add to this one where and when? When were they building castles? The Romans weren't really building castles. We don't really build castles today except for the man and Warner. Yes. So are we, going to make we are. We are. So I'm giving you plenty to choose from. Um, I'm going to peek over Juliana's shoulder. Um, the where, how, oh, um, yeah. Defense. Defense. How did a castle defend itself? Because, you know, this is the only reason I really built it. <laughs> probably to defend myself. There are probably others, but this gives you a good start. You're going to pick two because you're writing two paragraphs. If you are just so into castles, you can't stand it. You can do three if you want to, but I'm only asking you to do two. Okay. Now, does everyone have that written down? Can I erase that? Because I'm, I'm running out of room because I have that. Okay, so that's, that's step one. Pick two, I'll leave step one up there. Step two is read source one. and make a two paragraph outline. This is exactly, exactly what you've done for several weeks in a row, right? You put your outline, you know, it looks like this, Roman numeral one with points, Roman numeral two with points, and you fill in what is, what, how do you choose what to write down? Interesting or important, okay? And then you're done for that day. Then say the next day, read source two. And make another two paragraph outline. How many outlines do you have now? You have two outlines. You have one outline from, I'm just going to borrow these. You have one outline from this source. And you have an outline in this source. This is important. The same two topics. Don't pick two new topics. If I'm going to write about how were they built and how were they defended, I do it with this source and I do it with this source. Same two topics. Don't change topics. So do we meld them into one? Yes, that's the next step, Nathan. That's the next step. Okay. Step four is kind of weird. Um, I wish I hadn't taken up so much room writing that. Um, okay, so I have, I'm going to kind of write it small. This is, this is outline number one. All right. This is from source one. And I've picked um, how built and defenses. And I have read source one and I've written down whatever is interesting and important. Done. 
This is my outline from source two. I've chosen how built, one, two, three, four, and defenses. One, two, three, four. I've read source two and I filled it in with interesting and important. And now I'm looking at this. I have two outlines. The next day, I'm going to get another piece of paper out and I'm going to make one last outline. Maybe it's going to have at least five points. You could, you could do up to seven. And I'm, I would probably write it below, but you see, I don't want to write on their wall. So I'm going to write it over here, okay? And because I have a lot of information now. You know, I've read, I've read all these sources. I have a lot of information. So I'm going to give myself plenty of room. Same two topics. How built defenses. Got it. Now, here's what I'm going to do this day. I'm going to look at all this stuff I wrote down. I'm going to lay my outlines in front of me and I'm thinking, hmm, hmm, who do I like the best? Because maybe I repeated myself a little bit. Maybe I found things that could go together. I'm like, oh, man, this is really good. I'm going to write it down. Oh, oh, oh I, I love this one. This one, this one's good. And, and this one goes with this one. I'm going to put those in a row there. Um, that was really interesting. I want to make sure that makes it. And I go, oh, the other stuff was kind of meh. I don't know if it made the cut. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and then I do it with my second paragraph. Oh, oh, this and this, this was amazing. I'm putting it on my outline. Oh, and I, everything. This, this was such an amazing source. I, I want to use everything. Do, do, do. And I got to put a six because I just, I can't leave anything out. This thing we call the fused outline. Do you know what it means to fuse things together? You know, you, like you melt them together into one. I took these two outlines and I fused them. And now I have one outline that I can write from. I don't even need these anymore because they were just tools for me to get to this. Does the, do those steps make sense to everybody? Does it sound hard? I mean, basically, it's what you've just done the last few weeks only twice. And then just sort of picking the best of the best. This, hey, guys, this is the most important thing I'm going to say. Look at me. This is all I want you to do this week. You don't have to write the paper. Because you've been writing one every week. You're welcome. Um, but, but I want to see all three outlines next week. Bring me three outlines. Show me source one. Show me source two. Show me your fused outline. All right? Yes. Then you cannot show them to me next week, can you? But you also did this with me last year. So if you have a question, I want, you know, like call or email me. But otherwise, I absolve you from your duties. You, <laughs> Except I can't get faxes. That would be a... He could email it. He could scan it in email. But I'm not going to ask you to do that. If you just if you can't remember or you're unsure, but we did several of these last year, so I think you're good. Yes, Zach. Um, you said bring three. Yes. So, so you have five. I don't. This is one outline. Oh, okay. It's just got two paragraphs. This is one, and this is one. Oh. Okay. Does that make sense? Yep. But each of my outlines has two two paragraphs in it. Any question. I feel like when you're doing it, there might be a question. What are you going to do if there's a question? Um, yeah. Are you going to, are you going to cry? No, no, you wouldn't guys would cry. Are you going to, you know, stop eating and sleeping? No, you're not. You're going to email me or call me and just say, I am stuck. Help me. And I'll say, great, let's get you unstuck. Okay. And then show me, I'll come around next week and I will see your three outlines. And then next week, You'll write the paper and imagine how easy that week's going to be because you'll already have the outline. All you have to do is just write it out in sentences. Are we good? There's no, there's no silly question. If any question is lurking. Okay. If not, I am going to take this away. Um. <laughs> oh, okay. I said what? 
No, what? Loking. I feel like it should be a word. I like the way it sounds. Maybe we should make it. Make we should make a meaning for it. Oh, Loki. No, I don't know what I said. I say things, Zach, and then I don't remember what I said. People say, "Can you repeat that?" And I say, "I don't think so because I don't know what I said." Okay, let's look at our reading questions on page twenty-three. So the, so the first thing you're going to do is the, is the outlines and show me three outlines. Um, this week, we finished the chapter that I asked you to read before our first class because the very beginning of this chapter talked about St. Benedict. And I felt like he came at the very beginning, sort of right after the fall of Rome and the beginning of the Middle Ages. But, um, but we learned a little bit more about these monastic orders and cathedrals, which you learned a lot about cathedrals this week. Um, and... Uh, in, in, in section two, it just talked a little bit about what did these monks do? Um, they prayed a lot. And this is what I have on the board. These are the, this is the liturgy of the hours or the divine office. Um, so even today in monasteries, um, you pray uh, these times. And I've given you the roughly the time. So at 2 a.m., then you go back to bed a little while. Um, before sunrise, you get up for lauds, and then maybe you read in your room, study a little bit, and then again when the sun comes up, and then at 9 a.m., noon, 3 p.m., in the evening, and then after sunset. Um, th this is the, the, called the Liturgy of the Hours, the Divine Office, and they saw their job primarily to pray. That's what, that's what monks did. They prayed for the people who were out there and didn't have time to stop all night and all day to pray. And that's most of us, right? Um, we don't really, we have busy lives and we're going about our business, but um, there are people today taking time out of their day, every day, every few hours to pray for the world, to pray for all of us. Um, and I'm, I'm thankful for that. Yes, Nathan. Mm. So people take, like, shifts. Yes. Some, some churches locally will have a, usually Catholic churches do this. They have sort of an adoration room and they have um, the, the consecrated host. And, and they will, there's a sign-up sheet and they will book the room so the people are in there 24 hours a day praying, which is, which is pretty cool. Um, monks did this. This isn't all they did, though. And actually, can we just skip down to the second to last question? Because this seems like a good time to talk about it. What great contributions did monks make to medieval civilization? Somebody want to tell me at least one thing? What did they do, Hans? Society was okay. There... We, have we all seen a movie set in the Middle Ages? Probably. It's kind of, there were beautiful things in the Middle Ages, and we're going to look at some beautiful cathedrals. But life was rough. Life was rough. I, last week, I told you guys that I got to go to Canterbury Cathedral when I was a teenager and <clears throat> went down where Thomas Beckett had been murdered. But, you know, you walk around um, the the cloister, the, the courtyards, all right? So covered courtyards, and it's open in the middle, and there's columns, and there's walls, and there were um, engraved stones in memory of people, and these stones were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years old, you know, the, the engravings. And I stopped, and I read some of them, and I remarked how many people were, um, they were in memory of children who died. Lots of children who died. I mean, families that had six children, seven children, eight children, maybe one of them lived. Maybe none of them lived. It was a sad time. They, they couldn't treat a lot of the illnesses that we just go to the doctor and get pills in a bottle and, and we're fine. Then war, war is always brutal. War is not less brutal today, but it, was, it, it was, seemed to be happening all the time. If the Vikings aren't invading you, the duke in the neighboring village is invading you. 
And so these monks said, we, we don't engage in this. We are praying for all of you. And we just want to bring healing and hope. And sometimes we can tell people what to do. Have you ever noticed that when you tell someone what to do, they don't always listen? But if you act a certain way or show them what to do, they watch you. And sometimes they start doing it your way. I think that showing can be better than talking sometimes. That's a good one. Did anybody write another one? What else did monks do? Yeah, Zach. They wrote things down, and I'm so very happy that they wrote things down because almost everything I have taught the high school class for the past two years and this year, I have because some guy in a monastery wrote it down. He wrote a copy. They didn't just save copies of the Bible and, um, you know, writings of the church fathers. They saved everything they could get their hands on. Unfortunately, in the West, it, it wasn't a lot. In the entire Western world, until about, I don't know, 14, 1500 maybe, they only had one work of Plato. Plato wrote a lot, but there was only one that they had that had been translated into Latin and people could read. That's all they knew. That's all the Plato they knew. They didn't have the Iliad or the Odyssey. They just knew stories about it. They knew of it. Because they, they didn't have time to copy everything, you know. But what they did, it was amazing. Yes? So in contrast to um, the Arabic culture, which was very literate at the time, and, and valued not only books, but saw them as beautiful and, and did miniature art worship. Mm. So there were vast libraries, and wealth was associated with having large libraries. So in contrast, at the same time period, yeah, there was vast amounts of literature. And, Yes. And I think we talked about that a few, didn't we talk about that a month ago or something when we talked about the Muslim expansion? That they carried, when they took over Spain, they carried with them works of science, works of philosophy. Because remember in the East, they always had access to Greek. Even the, Arab, the Arabic speakers had learned Greek. They are Arabic scholars. In a time when most people in the West didn't, didn't have access to Greek anymore. They didn't know how to read it. And they did. So, you know, weirdly, we get Aristotle and Plato from the Arab world via North Africa to Spain and then, and then um, learning spreads. Thank you. Yeah, that's always good to remember. It's only Western Europe that we're talking about here, not the rest of the world. But the monks were a shining light in that. They said, this is a value and I will copy it. So it's a good one. Anybody, anybody you got another one? Anybody have another one? Dorothy Mills says, the monks developed large tracts of land that would otherwise have been left uncultivated. They drained swamps. You know, they'd move into a place. The, the monastery would get given a piece of land because nobody wanted it. Here, you guys can live here and build your little monastery here. And it's nasty. It's swampy. It's, it's the, the fields are full of rocks. We can't plow them. The monks went out, they started draining the swamps. Do you, do you know why it's not good to live near a swamp? Mosquitoes. mosquitoes. And why, why, is it just because mosquitoes are annoying? Yes. Why else? Malaria. Malaria is a disease that gives you a fever. I don't, what else does malaria do to you? It's not good. You, people die of malaria still. It's very easily treatable. But I actually know a couple who adopted a son from Africa, his dad died of malaria. He's, I don't know, a teenager now? It wasn't that long ago. His, his dad died of malaria and his mom couldn't take care of him without her husband being there. So he was adopted. So, but th th there's simple medications, but they don't have them in some places of the world. So they drained the swamps and they, and they moved the rocks and they, and they cleared the land and they started growing food and what did they do with this food? They didn't eat it all themselves. They, they gave it to hungry people. They gave it to the poor in the vicinity. They took care of the poor. They were the hospitals. There were monks who were very skilled in using medicinal herbs. So if you were sick, you went to the monks. 
And so um, she mentions schools, libraries, building projects. Many of these cathedrals were, uh, the idea was started by the local monastery. We want to build a beautiful church. So it was, I, I don't even know how to say it. I wanted to say, it's not like all they were doing was praying. What a terrible thing for me to want to say, because there's nothing more important we can do. Do you know? But remember St. Benedict, he had a motto, ora et labora, pray and work, that their lives should be a balance. And the Benedictine monasteries had strict guidelines, rules that they followed about, um, this is when we pray, this is when we study. This is when we get out there and roll up our sleeves and work so we can be of good, we can support ourselves and we can be of good to other people. Okay, that's enough of that. Um, so Benedict started his monastic uh, order. In the East, they had monastic orders. They never had more than one. It's just in, in the Eastern church, you, you're just a monk. You're not a certain kind of monk. You are just um, in a monastery. But in the West, we developed uh, new, n n new orders. This is the first question I asked you. Over the years, what happened to many of the original monasteries which followed the rule of St. Benedict? And what monastery was founded to combat this problem? What happened to the Benedictine monks? I didn't know what the word meant. I'm so glad you brought it up. They became lax. Does anybody else know what it means to be lax? Yes, yes. Lazy. Because when you relax, you know, so if you're lax, re means again, right? So I'm busy and then I relax. But what if I relax and then I'm just lax all the time and I never get up again and do anything? No, that's not so good. We need to get up and do again. And then we relax. That's the way to do it. That's the way to do it. When we find a word we don't, um, we don't know. Let me see if I can find exactly that sentence. Um, yeah, listen to, and then listen how you could work it out from the context. Some of these houses had grown lax concerning the strict observance of the rule. Lax concerning observance of the rule. Sounds like they're not observing the rule anymore, right? We eat whenever we want, and we sleep whenever we want. We do whatever we want, and maybe we make it to the prayer time, and maybe we don't. Lax. So people were concerned about this because these guys were the beacons. They were the shining lights, and 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 if, like Jesus said, if, if, if the salt loses its salt, how do you, saltiness, how do you make it salty again? And they were losing their saltiness. And, and so they founded new orders. Did anybody write down what monastery was founded to combat the problem? Um, it was on the same page. Um, the, the monastery yes. Oh. Yes. Oh. yes, yes, yes. Um, so all, all of the above. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and a thousand times. Cluny, Cluny, I heard somebody mention Cluny. Um, they, they founded a monastery at Cluny. This is in, in France. Is it in France today, Germany today? I don't know. Um, where they were much more strictly observing the rules of monasteries. And also, they were only answerable straight to the Pope. They did not have any overseer except the Pope. So he could change things, things could be changed quickly. Um, somebody mentioned Clairvaux and the Cistercian order. This was St. Bernard. Um, and uh, it says about St. Bernard, he feared no one and denounced evil wherever he saw it. But, but above all, all, sorry, at all times and in all places, he taught that the greatest thing in the world was the love of God. That's, I can't argue with that. We're going to meet a, another man in a few weeks that was known for just tramping around the countryside, loving God and loving everything he made. And I will just, 
leave you hanging as to who that person is. Um, and then there was a, um, oh, I just blew up the second question, didn't I? So sorry. What is the name of the order founded by St. Bernard? That was the Cistercians. The Cistercians. What was the strictest? Who were the strictest? The Carthusians. The, here's a quote about them. These men, it was said, who live on the rocks are harder than the rocks themselves. They have no pity on themselves or on those who dwell with them. Their sight is fearful, but their order is yet more fearful. Yes, Asher. You sure can. Is this where Rob Johnson was built? It's not. <laughs> it would be. You know, so my high schoolers, we talked about this a few weeks ago, and they wrote a, a short paper on it for me. What, what is the use? How do I say this? What good is it for Christians to practice disciplines? For example, um, fasting at certain times or praying. Yes, yeah, spiritual disciplines. But, but they're physical things you do. Um, the, 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 the three most common ones are prayer, fasting, and almsgiving or the three cr Christian disciplines, but we can just, uh, any other kind of discipline. It, do you think, cause this is kind of a hard question for us. Do you think they're worthwhile? And why do you think these men did, did this? He's with us. <laughs> well, yeah, okay, so somebody said to get attention. You know what? This could be a motivation. If I want to just everyone think I'm super Christian, like, look at me. Look at me. Look how awesome I practice the disciplines. Is there any other reason? Do you think all these guys, you know, some of them were buried in these monasteries in a, in a, they called them cells, their room cells. It doesn't mean like a prison cell that they couldn't get out, but they just referred to them as small room. And we don't even know their names. So good luck with that. It didn't really draw attention to themselves very well. Is there any other reason to do these things? Why did Jesus say, when you fast, don't be like the heathens who go, oh, look at me, I'm so hungry, I'm fasting. He said, Go wash your face, brush your hair, and buck up and act like a normal human being. Nobody needs to know you're fasting. But he didn't say if you fast. He said when you fast. Why bother? If it's not like Jaden said, just so I can show people, look at me, I'm awesomely fasting. Because Jesus said, don't do that. What good does it do us? Yes, but he said the bridegroom leaves, they will fast. This is a hard, this is kind of a, a not fair question I'm asking you, because it's something that a lot of grown-ups really think about, a lot of Christian groups think about. But I'm just going to throw this out for you to think about, that when we do these things, it, it changes us. For example, when Jesus was fasting, you know, for 40 days, and then Satan said, oh, well, there's some rocks. Just turn them into bread because you're the son of God. And, and Jesus said, it is written that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God, right? Yeah. And so when, I'll just tell you guys, when I'm fasting, which hopefully you guys will never know when that is because I won't be acting like it. Um, I remember other things I also rely on God for, you know, I can, I can deny myself that and God will take care of me. And you know what? I can deny myself other things and God will take care of me. And also when my, I'll just tell you when my tummy growls a little bit, it also, I remember what I'm doing. And then I remember why I'm doing it. And I think, oh, it's because God, God feeds my spirit. You don't, don't do it. Don't ever do it for very long. <laughs> don't hurt yourself, but or without your parents. But it changes you. And so C.S. Lewis told this story. Um, did I tell you the story about the dog, the adopted dog? Did I already do this to you guys? Okay. Um, so C.S. Lewis said, it's sort of like you adopt a dog at the shelter, you know? And the dog has very bad habits. 
the dog has been living on the street and the dog eats whenever and whatever it wants and frankly it poos whenever and wherever it wants. It stinks, it's got fleas, it's not good. And you bring the dog home and you wash it and you de-louse it and you put a flea collar on it and then you lay down paper on the floor and you tell it it can only poo there or you have to be taken outside. Now think of this from the dog's perspective. It's like, shoot, this isn't a very good deal. I was, I was living free. I could do anything I wanted. The dog probably forgets the lice and the fleas and the dirt and the squalor and the days it had no food, but it just feels like it's being punished. But the the master of the dog knows it's not punishing the dog. What's it doing? It's making it so the dog is fit to live with the master, right? So, hey, you know, Rover, come in the living room. Sit here by the fire and the children will play with you and pet you. But not if you poo anywhere and not if you have lice and fleas and not if you're filthy. And C.S. Lewis said, God's sort of like that with us. When we practice the disciplines, it's like getting used to live in the master's house. Sometimes it's not comfortable for us, like it's not comfortable for the dog, you know, but it's for a good end. Anyway, I'm sorry. Now I've done a little sermon. Um, okay. What great buildings were the greatest examples of medieval architecture and art? If you can't answer this question, oh, I'm going to be angry. Yes, cathedrals in general, although that one is beautiful. Were you going to add or just, and I, I was threatening you because you just wrote a paper on cathedrals. And I, everybody should get this one right. Cathedrals. Do you know, oh, I can take this away now. Not every big, beautiful church is a cathedral. A cathedral is a special church. Just a second. It is a church that has a cathedra. That's not very helpful, Mrs. Ferguson. What's a cathedra? The cathedra is the bishop's chair. The chair in which the bishop sits, it is the seat of the bishop. So, um, so if, and bishops rule over a, a geographical area, right? So um, in Illinois, in that part of Illinois, the cathedral is in Peoria. The nearest bishop, the bishop of that area is in Peoria. In Davenport, the cathedral's in Davenport. Just ask it. I think it's sa Sacred Heart. Is the cathedral. It's where the bishop of the region is. What did you say? Is it pretty big? I don't know Davenport very well. Um, so cathedrals are the home church of the bishop of the area. Does that make sense? And I, I mentioned in the email to your parents um, this, this fabulous book by David McCauley. If you've never seen books by David McCauley, oh my goodness, run, do not walk to the nearest library and check out books by David McCauley. Um, he was very popular in the 1980s and early 90s. And he, he is an artist and an engineer, and he draws beautiful sketches of the process of building things. Um, he had a very fun book called The Way Things Work. It was very, very popular once upon a time. Um, so I have these two pictures, and they're very, very similar. This is the floor plan. Can you guys kind of see back there? Can you? Because these are pretty big pictures. Can you see the general shape? It looks like a tree. What else does it look a little bit like? A man. Yeah, a man. You know, but a man does kind of look like a cross, right? They're, they were going for cross. <laughs> although I'm not going to argue with man or tree. Um, so yeah, this one, this one doesn't have a very short, it has a very short transept, the part that goes across. This one has a little bit longer one. They laid them out in the shape of a cross, obviously on purpose, and they almost always faced east. So the rounded part is the place where the altar is going to be and the, and the congregation is going to face that direction. And, and they faced east. This was just a, an early like all through Christian history, churches faced east. Um, in, in Orthodox churches, they still try to build them if they can facing east and, and, the, and have the congregation facing east. Um, for a couple of reasons, I think. For, for Western Europe, Jerusalem is east. And also 
the sun rises in the east. Yes. You go right ahead. Guys, you're not little kids anymore, by the way. If you need to get up and leave, you don't have to wait for me to. It's okay. All right. I'm not going to be offended. You're not going to bother me. If I'm talking and talking and talking, because if I see your hand, I may think you just have a comment and I want to finish my comment. But if you need to leave, please don't feel bad. You don't have to ask. It's okay. I trust you guys. Um, okay. So I brought some pictures of um, cathedrals. And I'm just going to kind of well, let's come out here and walk around a little bit. Um, let me show you these two pictures. Can you see the, the difference between these two? D d d tell me a little bit about what seems different. Oh, that's a really good description. Which which is which one is this? Open or locked up? Open. Okay, and which one is this? Oh, that's the opposite of what I was thinking. Can you then you, can you tell me more what you mean by open or locked up? Oh, okay. Lights. I guess that one just looks like uh, that one also looks factory, and then that one just looks like a giant castle. So one on the right, okay. The one on the right looks a little bit older. Looks older. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And it's like yeah, open. The one on the right has more detail. Yeah, it, yeah, it has like a it. lot more detail, but I guess the other one. Do you think this one has more detail? Is that what you're saying? This one has more detail. Okay. Yeah, they it's a lot. Of it's a lot of detail. That one. These these are both cathedrals in France today. They're not the same cathedral. And um, this this one is uh, Chartres, uh, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Um, uh, so so when they started building cathedrals, they they didn't they weren't. I don't know why I say it, as fancy as this. Um, they were very thick. Uh, the walls were thick, and they were patterned on Roman basilicas. Uh, the Romans built these long uh, buildings, and they were public buildings. They were like the court room, or the, like city hall, or something like that. And and they and they used this because it was a nice shape, and they knew how to build these. And so the early church is building these, but but eventually it got grander and grander. I was thinking, I don't know, to me, because that's why I asked you, like this one seems more open and this one seems more locked up because it just seems so heavy. It looks heavy and this one looks lighter, but like delicate. Do, do you know what I mean? Um, It is a lot. If they, had, if they had, like, <laughs> at least, like, three different colors, it would have looked, like, like amazing. Like, oh. It is. But, it would have looked actually kind of cool. So you think it seems a little busy, maybe, it, it, it it just with all the detail? Like the Empire State Forum, not the Empire State mm. It looked like the old World Trade Center. Oh. Oh, this feeling is more decorative. Did you guys notice? Did you guys notice the people at the bottom? To give you a sense of the size of this building. There's a there's a guy right there on the bottom of this one. Um. They so they built these kind of heavier buildings, heavier than this. This is this is not what I mean. And eventually, engineers developed a process. By which, okay, so, okay, my husband is an engineer. I am not. So my husband, if he were here, he would probably cringe and make faces at what I'm about to do. But it's, my grandpa used to say, good enough for who it's for. Like, it's good enough for us. Okay. So if you have very uh, uh, thick, thick walls, you know, stone, they're going to have to be pretty thick if you have a roof structure, and I know the roof might not just be flat, um, often in Greek temples it was, um, it takes a lot 
to hold it up. Does this make sense to you? Because the pressures that come down from gravity feed into these side columns. And, they, and it's a lot of forces. This is what my husband does for a living. He, he calculates the forces. Uh, yes. So yeah, if you put one in the middle, this helps and I can make a bigger space. But I got a huge column in the middle of my church and I don't like it, Jaden. It's ugly. I'm looking around it all the time. I can't see. I don't like it. So eventually, structural engineers in the Middle Ages realized something. They realized that I can take that force and put it into side supports. And the forces, some of them will still go down, but many of them will, will be carried into the ground down the side. And if I build more than one of them, Yes. Just that, hold on about that. Hold on about that. Um, and now these don't have to be so thick because they're not, they're not carrying all the weight. I can make them much thinner. And when I do, I have more room, but I also have room for gorgeous holes that I can fill with stained glass. The, the bigger, the older, uh, Romanesque it's called, because they're based on a Roman building, right? They're Romanesque, and, and they were heavy and squat and dark. And so they started building this way, and it let in the light. It let in the light, and I mean it let in the light. This is, how can I show you all these at the same time? Oh, okay. So this, mm, all right, we'll do this one at a time. I'm going to go around. This is the exterior. I think this is in your book, too. Um, here, I'm going to put my finger below the place. This is the exterior of that same cathedral. Do you see the, 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 the curved stone places, the places where it's curving out from the building? Do you, do you see what I mean? Like it's attached, but it curves out. That's the buttresses. That's the flying buttresses. They're holding the weight. They're holding the weight so that they can put thinner walls and um, here, I'm going to show you three at the same time. Do you see here? You've seen pictures, I'm sure. And so it, it enables us to make much thinner walls. Here, I'm going to just do for all four of you guys at the same time. Right here. On top. You know what? You're not the first person to ask me this. I should ask my husband sometime, but I suspect it's because of lack of strength. No, pumice is the lightest rock on the Light, but is it strong? No. Will it crumble quickly? This is the thing. If I'm in a building, I want to make sure it's held up by something strong. Here, I'll do you two and you two. So you see the buttresses there? It's a beautiful, so beautiful. This building is just amazing. Remember, built by no mechanized, you know, no gas powered machinery despite the fact that it's really tall. And, and then, so we can open up the windows and I'll just quickly, this is a close up. And this is uh, called the rose window. This is the famous window at the Chartres Cathedral. It's beautiful. And um, my kids had a little history book by an by a old um, writer named V.M. Hillier. That was the Calvert School um, book. And, and the chapter on this was called Bibles in Stone and Glass because they told Bible stories in the windows. What? A lot of people couldn't read. A lot of people couldn't read. And if you could read, you couldn't afford a Bible for crying out loud. That's expensive. Only your local church can have a Bible. Yes, yes. Actually, this is not a Bible story. I brought this all. This is the life of Charlemagne. But, but it, it does double duty for just showing you that they showed the pictures in the glass. Um, so imagine the team of people that has to build this cathedral. You've got to have stone cutters. Um, you've got to have uh, sculptors to, to make the, 
the gargoyles and the decorations, the statues. You've got to have glass makers. You've got to have a whole team of people to put this together. And so this book that I brought in, I was, what time is it? Eh, I'm not going to show you all the pictures. Um, I'll leave this here if you want to glance through it or, you know, like get a copy at home. Um, it, it, this is a fictional account, but based on, on actual records of the building of a cathedral. In this particular book, it takes them about 80 years to build the cathedral. Often a town would decide that they wanted to build a new cathedral. And the people who started it knew very, very well that they were never going to live to see it finished, most likely. And this interests me because we like things to happen fast. Don't, don't you like things to happen fast? Yeah, I like things. Do, do you ever feel like the microwave takes too long to warm up your food? Yeah. Like, do you ever stand and stare at the microwave? Like, you poor, you poor souls. You know, there were, I'm, okay, I'm doing the old person thing. Like, there were no microwaves when I was a little girl. It's like you put it in a pan on the stove and you waited for it to warm up. You know, or put it in the oven. And, and, you know, sometimes you wait and the internet is going slow. You know, it's not loading. <laughs> load, load. We are so impatient. And the idea of starting something, I'm never, ever going to live to see done. Wow. But you know what? Kind of like having children and having a family is a little like that. I mean, I got to see my children grow up. But I someday, I, I mean, will I see grandchildren? Maybe great grandchildren? I don't know what will happen to my descendants. I started something that I don't really get to see the end of. So we do it. But um, maybe the things that really matter, I don't know. I'm thinking also of planting trees. Some trees take a long time to mature, you know? Um, anyway, that is cathedrals. If you get a chance to go, have any of you ever traveled in Europe? Like, have any of you ever gotten to go to a cathedral? Maybe you will someday. Go and tour one. It is beautiful. I told you I went to Canterbury. It's not one of the, it was beautiful, but it's not that. And I only had three hours there. And then they told us to get back on the bus, which was just not right. But um, I think it's a miracle that we have them still because Europe has had a lot of wars and they were nasty wars where a lot of bombs were dropped from the sky, you know? And still we have these beautiful buildings. Do you guys remember that Notre Dame Cathedral caught on fire? Are you old enough to remember? This was not very many years ago, but you were probably pretty young. Okay. I remember it. It was like, it was like 20 years ago. I am thankful for the things that we still have from the past that they built. The, the, men, the men who built this, you know, beautiful building, had no idea that, you know, centuries, generations and generations later would be admiring it. I think that they would more want it to be used for worship than admiring, probably. But I don't think they'd mind the admiring. It is. It is. And I, I blew off one of your questions back there. You talked about the arches. And so let me just show you this from a distance. Um, so if we're going to build an arch, we build a wooden, we build a wooden um, template. We build a wooden form. And then we put stone and some concrete over the top of it. And when it's all set, we can take away the wooden form. It was not uncommon for things to collapse and kill people. It was not uncommon. Because it wasn't set well. Um, people don't really change. And just like today, back then there were people who could make a little extra money by cutting corners and not doing the job as thoroughly or using cheaper materials. And it would collapse and kill people. It happened. So, 
Anyway, that was that's how they did the arches. You, you have a wooden form that you use. And then when it's all stone, concrete, and set, you can remove the wooden form. All right. Well, if you are into cathedrals, this book is very informative, David Macaulay Cathedral, and I put it in the email that I sent to your parents. And I'm sure the library, local libraries will have multiple copies of it if you want to check it out. Um, okay, so next week, I want you guys to read chapter 10. And we are going to go back to this idea of feudalism. What is the feudal system? We talked about it last week a little bit. And I told you, we'll revisit this. Well, next week is the week we revisit it. And we're going to talk a little bit about knights. Everybody loves knights. Not knights with a K. You know, not the opposite of day. Knights with armor. I, that's the thing about words that are legitimate even if you miss a letter. This is why you should always proofread and never just trust spell check blindly. This is always a good thing. Okay, so what do we have so far? You're making three outlines for me. A source one, a source two, a fused, and you're going to show them to me. You're going to read chapter 10. The last thing I want to do is talk about the children of Odin, because do you notice, except for the unfortunate kind of lame Ragnarok ending, uh, it wasn't a lot about the gods. It was about this family, Sigurd and, 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 and Brunhild and this family. Before we launch into that, though, because I'm watching the clock and I have not forgotten the video. Okay. Um, we are going to start reading King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. Do we all kind of know something about King Arthur? Have we heard of King Arthur before? Okay. You have... Roger Lancelin Green, yes. Well, you're going to read it again. It's because it's a good book. I've read it multiple times and I always notice. It. Very good. Very good. Um, King Arthur probably was a real person. Probably lived, I don't know, in 400s, 500 ish in Britain. Um, all we know about this guy is that apparently he came from a good Roman family. You know, the Romans had sort of left Britain, but he was one of the holdout Roman families. Um, and for whatever reason, he got chosen. He's one of the chosen ones to have tons of weird stories to be told about him. Um, and they are a little weird. I would like you to read book one. So it's, I, you know, like the whole book, no. If you look in the table of contents, instead of sections, it says book one. Book one has four chapters, and it says book two, and it has chapters. We're reading the first four chapters, book one. All right? Oh. Oh. I cannot tell you anything about the sword. I cannot tell you anything about anything. I you. Oh, don't tell anyone. <laughs> Just in case. Just in case. Okay. Do you remember that Loki killed an otter? For no good reason at all. But he's just a jerk. And... Yeah. Because he can. I think he threw a rock, but it doesn't, he kills him. His dad is not happy about this. Not Loki's dad, uh, the otter's dad. No, Odin was fine. Odin was fine. Well, he did say, why did you do that? Because like, I wanted to, because that's why Loki does anything. And, and, and so uh, otter's dad said, what are you going to do? to reimburse me and and pay me back for killing my son and Odin Odin oh what are you thinking you're the you're the head god you're the king of the gods you should be smarter than this offer him wisdom offer him a beautiful wife offer him no money i will give you gold i will pay you great so bring me gold
Oh, yeah, that would be right. Except, you know what, Jane? These gods are not immortal, are they? These gods are not immortal because they, they will die at Ragnarok. And I think we talked about that the first week we started this. Imagine your gods are not all that smart, act like jerks, and aren't immortal and don't know everything. What? That's depressing. J.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis both loved these stories, you know, and they said there was sort of a depressingness about it, but there was a grandeur too because they're they're fighting against against odds, right? They're all going to die at Ragnarok. Well, a handful of them make it, you know, but but we will fight anyway. All right, I guess I respect that, but I don't know. I want God to be all knowing and all powerful and immortal. Um, anyway, so so they go to Andvari the dwarf. Do you remember this? And Andvari has a gold hoard. We met a gold hoard in Beowulf. Who was guarding that gold hoard? Do you remember? Dragon was guarding the, the group. Gold hoards are bad business. If you find a gold hoard, be very careful. Don't, don't just start grabbing it and take it. In stories, this never ends well. Gold hoards never end well in stories. It didn't end well for Babe, although he did take out the dragon, which was awesome. And he was like 70 plus years old. But they stuck the, the, the treasure back in the ground because they knew better than to mess with a cursed treasure. Got another treasure. And Vari is a dwarf. And he loves his treasure so much that he's turned himself into a fish to swim back and forth at the entrance of his I get the idea that you have to go under the water to get to the cave that has his gold hoard. And, and he's given up all companionship with the other dwarves. He's given up his job. He's given up the sunlight. He's given up everything because he just wants his gold. Well, Loki gets the and And Vari, the dwarf, he wasn't a fish anymore, you know. He, he, he just kind of hit it, hit it. And Loki said, fork over the ring, want the ring. The ring, it turns out, makes more gold. Andvari could lose all the rest of his treasure, but if he had that ring, he could remake the treasure. Look, hand it over. So Loki also just kind of puts the ring on his finger and doesn't tell Odin about it. Do you notice how everybody who gets a hold of this ring starts acting wonky? And so I'm going to hide the ring. And, and so Otter's dad is checking because remember they have to have a piece of gold to cover every hair on otter's body it's a lot of hair otters have a lot of hair you know so and and so his dad's looking oh 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 hair with no gold owns loki the ring the ring all right puts the ring on the hair the ring passes to but there's a lot of hair. Yeah. I have never tried to count hair on a mammal, but I feel like there would be a lot. Yes, Zach. Yes. Only two things, but. <laughs> Oh. Oh, you're smarter than Loki and Odin. So, just make some more gold and Oh man, major plot hole. Oh, oh, I'm almost sorry you said that cuz I'm like, shoot. You're right. All right, Asher, what were you going to say? You know, if you guys had been there, the story would end so much better for all these people. But you weren't, and it doesn't. Fafnir, oh, yes. Like shaving? 
Uh, but but they already cut the deal. Then like it's already dog. already yes, I will cover yeah, every hair. Be a corn dog. Well, yeah. Uh, you know what? Loki is pretty low, but at that point he's not even that low. So, um, so so you know, one of the sons we find out kills dad, and Fafnir turns into a what? Dragon, because just like C.S. Lewis teaches us in the Voyage of the Dawn Treader, when you lounge around on gold dragon on gold hordes that are cursed, and you get dragony thoughts, and you turn into a dragon yourself. And this is Fafnir. So Sigurd. Then we meet Sigurd, right? Sigurd, hero. His dad died in battle. His dad left him an awesome sword that could be remade. He's got all the he's got all the hero qualities, and um. And one day he's, he's out and, and he's looking at a herd of horses. And a stranger walks up, a stranger with an eye patch. Odin, right? Whenever we see a stranger with an eye patch, because Odin gave his eye to, to, at the well of Mimir, he gave his eye to Mimir. Um, and, and the guy says, oh, which one would you choose? And Sigurd says, I like that one. And the guy, the stranger says, oh, good choice. Because you know what? He's from the horses of the gods. He's a descendant of the horses of the gods. And um, and I am of the race of the sons of Odin, cries Sigurd, his eyes wide and shining with the very light of the sun. I am of the race of the sons of Odin, for my father was Sigmund, and his father was Volsung, and his father was Rerir, and his father was Sigi, who was the son of Odin. The stranger leaned on his staff and looked, step, looked at the youth steadily. Only one of his eyes must be seen, but that eye, Sigurd, is a the stone. All thou hast named, the stranger said, were as swords of Odin to send men to Valhalla, Odin's hall of heroes. And all of all that thou hast named, there were none but were chosen by Odin's Valkyries for battles in Asgard. Cried Sigurd, too much of what is brave and noble in the world is taken by Odin for his battles in Asgard. Remember, he has these ladies named Valkyries, and they go to battlefields and they snatch up warriors. It almost sounds like they cause their deaths. Why? So Odin can take them to Valhalla, where I think, as we mentioned before, they fight all day and hack each other into pieces. Then they collect all the pieces and put them together and they party all night. And then they do it again the next day. That's not it is not, it is not good. The point of Valhalla is he's stocking an army for Ragnarok. His Valkyries go collect people, good heroes, good warriors, and take them to Valhalla so they can fight at Ragnarok. And Sigurd says, Odin takes too many. My dad, says Sigurd. The stranger leaned on his staff and his head was bowed. What wouldst thou, he asked. And it did not seem to Sigurd that he spoke to him. What wouldst thou? The leaves wither and fall off Yggdrasil and the day of Ragnarok comes. Odin feels like he has no other choice. I gotta have an army. I gotta snatch those warriors. It's not the best plan, but it's the only plan I got. Sigurd is, as you recall, sort of tricked into killing Fafnir. And when he goes into the horde that Fafnir used to guard, he checks it out and it says he found a helmet of gold and he put it on his head. He found a great arm ring and put it around his arm. On the top of the arm ring, there was a small finger ring with a rune engraved upon it. Sigurd put it on his finger, and this was the ring that Andvari the dwarf had put the curse upon when Loki had taken the hoard from him. Brunhild is a Valkyrie. She also isn't real keen with Odin's plan to just snatch up the best and the brightest, and she goes down to a battle and she lets the wrong guy win. She saves the guy she's supposed to take to Valhalla, and Odin says, you're out. You're out of the Valkyrie job. You're fired. 
you know, a mortal woman. She said, well, you deserve to give me something. He's like, okay, what do you want? I want to marry only the bravest and best. The bravest and best man is the only one who can win me. Great. I'm going to put you in this castle, in this hall, surrounded by flames. And only a guy brave enough to get through the flames and find you will marry you. And meanwhile, I'm putting you to sleep. Great. Sleeping beauty situation. Brunhild is asleep. Meanwhile, Sigurd is being awesome all over the place. And here's about pretty lady in Hall of Fire. Going to check her out. Makes it through the fire. And he says, okay, I'll marry you, but I got to go be awesome some more. <laughs> I'll come back when I'm done being awesome. They gazed long on each other, but little more they spoke. Then they held each other's hands in farewell, and they plighted faith, promising each other that they would take no other man or maiden for their mate. And for token of their troth, Sigurd took the ring that was on his finger and placed it on Brunhild's and Vari's ring it was. All right, so we're reading. This is not going to end well. We already know it's that ring is bad news. It is bad news because Sigurd takes up with the family of the Nibelungs. And the brothers are, yay, love, we're just best buds, and we go hunting all the time. But Sister Nibelung really likes Sigurd. Mom of Sister Nibelung knows her daughter really likes Sigurd. Mom drugs Sigurd so he can't remember any former loves. And they show up at the Hall of Fire with the brothers. He doesn't remember it. The brother says, I'm going to go and get that maiden. Yeah, good luck. He can't go through. Just so happens Sigurd is able to change his form. This is also a, a, a gift he's acquired. And he turns in to the other guy and wins her. You guys read it. You know this crashes and burns, doesn't it? Eventually he remembers the other lady. She's already married to the other guy. Now she's not married to the best and the brightest. Sigurd had wed, now that Sigurd had wed Gudrun, the sister, he was one with the Nibelungs. The hoard that was in Fafnir's cave, he brought away and he left it in their treasure house. The Nibelungs now have the cursed treasure. He had no memory of the house of flame, nor of Brunhild who waited there for him. It's not spoiling it to tell you pretty much everybody dies at the end of this story. It's not a pretty story because of that blasted treasure and that ring. This is the famous story, that the, the ring of the Nibelungs. The, the story of the ring told and told again, made into a, a cycle of operas by a composer named Wagner, which I don't think you're going to scramble home and listen to. Wagner's ring cycle. But just to know the story and just to know this plays a, a huge part in our culture. People have been telling this story and writing music about it. And I sent a message to your parents. If you have never seen What's Opera Doc, you must go home and get on YouTube immediately. There is, I, I just, everybody should know this. Um, the, the best. Bugs Bunny, Elmer Fudd cartoon ever made it was an opera to, to the, the ring, Wagner's ring uh, music. Um, and so if you, if you do yourself a favor and you spend five or six minutes watching the most hilarious cartoon ever made, um, it is the music of, of the ring of the Nibelungs. And this is how I know it because I'm not very classy. All my, all my classical music came through Bugs Bunny. Um, it's fair amount, though. Fair amount. Oh, the bar no, the Barber of Seville is the second greatest. Oh my gosh! But what's this is called? What's Opera Doc? Oh, oh, and oh, I'm I'm playing the whole thing in my head now. Um, okay, enough of that. It is 10:01. Let's do it. All right, I'm going to shut off the, the recording. You know what? I can show it to him separately.